So, welcome back to the next section. This session here will take you far away from economy, the ECB numbers, and all the fascinating things you heard about in the first part. We'll talk about how Europe negotiates, how uh, Europe can make a difference, both regionally and uh, globally. And um, so, for this, we have a, a great panel here, um, with uh, here first, Karin Stavridek Paulsen, who is a Danish, um, uh, documentary movie maker who has made the movie that we're going to talk about uh, in just a moment, The Agreement. The Agreement portrays um, one of uh, Europe's finest negotiators. Now Sir Robert Cooper, uh, with a long-standing diplomatic um, track record, which used to be um, one of the main negotiators in the European Union, and we will see him here in action uh, dealing with Serbia uh, and, and Kosovo. So um, I think this is a, uh, a great panel. Look forward to the discussion. I myself is um, Jonas Parola Plesma. I uh, used to be in a think tank, the European Council of Foreign Relations, but is now uh, heading the foreign policy uh, team at the Danish Embassy in, uh, in Washington. So um, I have uh, a little bit of experience with uh, negotiation uh, myself and uh, dealing with Europe, and is on the advisory panel here of the, of the think tank. So um, with that, um, so this is not just talk, but also um, movie and, and action. So we're actually going to start here with, um, with showing you a first clip that gives you a good introduction to, uh, to this movie here. I uh, brought up the, the DVD, I think it's outside here as well, Cold Agreement. So let's see uh, first what this is all about when Europe negotiates. had just been established, or it was had just come up and running, and I was working uh, part-time myself in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. 
and in my office there was the European correspondent, so I was very interested in how this was going to work and uh, thinking that, wow, maybe we give Europe a whole new voice internationally and it would be fantastic. And then I was part of arranging a conference uh, in August where Robert participated. I think it was something about uh, democracy and fragile states. And I remember that everybody talked about the concept of democracy in uh, many different theoretical ways. And I was not so interested, to be honest. And then uh, Robert entered the stage and started out saying, I don't like the word of I don't like the word democracy, and the whole the hall was saying, oh, "What? This is what it's all about." And then I found that he was being um, saying very clever and interesting stuff, and I thought he was an interesting person. And as well, he was Aston's, um, uh, you know, better than I, uh, <laughs> your title. Uh, oh yeah, but, long title. Yeah, long title, but dealing with the European Union External Action Service, so I thought he must be doing interesting stuff. So I approached him and requested, um, I think, just a meeting to talk about the idea of making a documentary film about his work, and I wanted, if possible, to make a um, successful story of European uh, foreign relations, because I think that's a very rare story in the media, that's very rarely what you hear. Um, and then it was actually Robert that suggested the Serbia-Kosovo dialogue as uh, something he dealt with and that hopefully would become a success for the European Union. Then as a director, I think what would be really interesting is to hear how did you manage to become, which you are really in, in the movie of the Wall, there's one time I know where you can see that Robert is looking at you, looking at the camera, but otherwise you're actually just in there and you don't notice. So tell us a little bit about how you achieved that as a sort of movie director of, of being part of these quite sort of tense negotiations and, and sort of be accepted as part of the deco in the room. Well, I think my finest task as a director was to, to build the trust to everyone and to also find a way of, of representing uh, these very sensitive negotiations and the characters involved in a way that was uh, uh, where everybody felt represented. So from, I think my task was to, to build this trust with everyone. And then I think it's not only something you plan and then you have a long-term strategy on how to enter and, and do this. It's really a process where you get to know people and by chance you're in, uh, both in Kosovo at the same time or you come next time to Brussels and everybody know each other and it seems like uh, a little family and uh, slowly me and my co-photographer were led inside. But I think... <laughs> Maybe yeah. I can, can sure. add something there. I, I, uh, there are bits of the film when I looked at it, I say to myself, why on earth did we let Karen film that? And the, <laughs> and the answer is, uh, after you've been negotiating something or other for about three days, you're tired and fed up and you can't be bothered. And actually, and Karen was there all the time and everybody stopped noticing her. Um, and I would also say that, um, uh, uh, that she was extremely fair, I thought, to all of the parties, um, not just when she was making the film, but afterwards, because with the editing, you can do anything. You've got all the film, you can tell what story you like. Uh, so, um, uh, so I was very relieved, because you could have made many different stories out of the <laughs> hundred hours or so of uh, material that you had. That's actually an interesting point. Did you have a discussion about that with the final cut, or uh, on what elements to, to leave in or out? Well, we did have talks all the way through, actually, and I think um, it, it, I feel it's a false dichotomy to say that there was me as an author that wanted my um, artistic or journalistic freedom, and then there were them that wanted to protect uh, scenes from being shown. I felt much more it was kind of um, a cooperation in a way where. I was also searching for what is actually interesting, what is the truth, how are these people. And, and when they saw something, I heard some reactions that also sometimes uh, inspired to, aha, there's actually something here which I have left out or which is not truly representing how the story was. So it wasn't, it wasn't a fight in that sense. We had the screening where you watch the film and we never... I was never censored on one single thing, actually. Mm. Uh, it was 
something which we talked about and I had a feeling of what is uh, important and what is not important. And of course the details which you shouldn't put in just to harm a political process. Because what's the reason for me to make this film then? If it's going to, to the whole agenda afterwards will be some political detail in Kosovo and it's all taken over by that debate. So that was important um, to not harm the political process. Another element which I, th I think you could introduce before we, we sort of see the next clip would be other characters. Because we're, um, how you, apart from building this as a story around negotiators, also how you build this around a story about persons and, and you both sort of follow Stefanovic and uh, Edita into the, their respective home setting. So if you could tell a little bit about them as characters, because that we don't see that much in the clips we've, we've sort of selected, but uh, I think that's an important uh, point of uh, the whole documentary and a good reason to, to watch it beyond sort of the clips that you're going to see now. Yes, well, actually, another thing I remember we talked about in our very first meeting was that I said I need some good characters to, to take this story or to tell this story. And you said, I think then the Serbia Kosovo is, it might be a good case. And it was such a big present when Edita and Boko entered the room because they are fabulous characters. And they are really each other's uh, opposites. Edita is this 55-year-old uh, uh, ice queen from Kosovo. And she, is, she fought during the war. She was the Ministry of, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs. And at the same time, she's just such a lady. And she doesn't show up before she's been to the hairdresser in the morning and she has this Balkan bleached hair and red nails and she comes with her followers of uh, five young men that take care of everything for her and she's a core negotiator but um, she has, she's a fantastic woman and I like her a lot and then there's Stefanovic which is much younger uh, kind of a more charming young uh, Balkan Serbian guy and he's actually much more relaxed than she is. She's, he's joking around with everybody, but a very charming person. And at the same time, as everybody, is still a Serb nationalist and very tough on, on, on the red lines. And of course, he has uh, the Serbian president and the Serbian lawyers uh, at, at home, which he has to live up to. But he used to play in a, in a punk rock band that was against Milosevic. He was also a part of Hot Pot, uh, the, the, young, the youth movement against Milosevic. So there were two very interesting characters that really managed to clash also sometimes in negotiation. But at the same time, they were also able to, they had cigarettes in the back together and had um, chats. So I think they were fantastic characters to, to tell the two country stories. Well, they, they, they really are, and that sort of turns me, uh, fits nicely with seeing a next sort of scene from, uh, from the movie, um, where we will see more of these fascinating characters and Robert Cooper in, in action negotiating. I think the European Union is a fantastic success. It puts an end to a thousand years of conflict. If we are successful in pacifying the Balkans, then people will look at the European Union with a bit more respect. At least if we fell flat on our face, then they wouldn't. I want to congratulate them for their determination over these months and for the courage that they have. It's very important that now what we're seeing is a step away from the past and for both of them a step closer to Europe.
Now, Robert, I'd like to turn to you and sort of hear um, maybe first on a sort of very short reader's digest for all of us. Why does it serve your cultural matter to Europe? Um, so, on, and to all of us, what was sort of the, the background between these negotiations and, uh, and, and why it mattered? Well, a, a, a lot of people of my generation and the generation below, uh, the wars in the Balkans were, were a big experience. There were, I don't know how many people killed, 150,000, enormous. Uh, the first time there was this kind of violence on the European continent since World War II. Um, and nobody knew how to handle it. Uh, we handled it actually extremely badly. Uh, so um, since then, in different ways, we've been, we've been recovering from that. Um, uh, and um, the real, the, the moment when the Balkans began to recover, and the process is not nearly finished yet, uh, was the moment when we decided clearly that uh, there was no alternative but to include the Balkans in the European Union. Um, and that has been the big carrot ever since. Um, uh, and now Slovenia and Croatia are both members. Um, uh, and I don't know how it is with Croatia. Slovenia was, on the whole, a, a good member of the European Union. Um, maybe less good the moment they started negotiating with Croatia. So um, what the European Union doesn't want to do is it doesn't want to import unsolved problems. Uh, and Serbia, Kosovo is evidently an unsolved problem. There's also, so that's one motive, that's one reason why it's necessary to uh, it's necessary to fix relations between Serbia and Kosovo. The other reason is um, that uh, there is still, um, I think it's less all the time, but there is still a risk of violence. It's not over yet. Uh, particularly uh, the risk of violence in the north of Kosovo, uh, where there is a Serb population that thinks they should be on the other side of the border in Serbia. Well, the whole of the European Union is a story of people who think they should be on the other side of the border. I don't know how it is in Schleswig-Holstein, maybe uh, <laughs> yeah. there are people there. Um, um, and uh, the story of the European Union is one in which we agreed that we were never going to move borders, uh, but we were going to make borders irrelevant. Um, and in the long run, that's what we need to do in the Balkans. We sort of need to restore Yugoslavia, just as the whole European Union is an attempt to restore the Holy Roman Empire. Um, and even Henry VIII tried to become the emperor at one point, so even Britain belongs in this. <laughs> and do you see that happening? Do you see both Serbia and Kosovo in the European Union in a, in a foreseeable future? Uh, well, uh, Serbia is now negotiating, and, and that, will take, that will take some time. It's, it's not just a matter of changing the laws, it's not a technical thing. You actually need uh, particularly these days, because in the past we've maybe gone too fast, you need to convince the member states of the European Union that you are going to be a... Uh, that you, that, uh, the European Union is a union of law, and you need to convince people that your legal system is sound, that your judges are reasonable, that the law is operated without political influence. You need to convince them that you're a society like other European societies. Um, that's actually quite tough. It's more tough than ticking the boxes about this, that, and the other rule. Uh, and in the Balkans, it's very tough, because that's not the way life has been there before. Uh, so I, it, it will be some time. And there have got to be still some big changes in both Serbia and Kosovo. And when you talk about this as a sort of the semicolon to a long, much longer European history, um, I wanted you to give the opportunity to expand on that a little bit. What what the European Union means for you? Well, I, uh, that's really a long, long story. Uh, the, um, uh, uh, if you, I, I happen to be thinking about uh, the great cardinal, Cardinal Richelieu. Uh, he always talked about a, um, uh, a good Christian peace that he said he wanted. Um, uh, but actually, France was still fighting wars when he died, and they continued to fight wars through the, um, through the 19th century. Um, uh, uh, and um, 
through the 20th century, we know the story. So the good Christian peace that Richelieu was talking about uh, in the 1630s, uh, that's what has finally arrived after World War II. So is there another one, Kant, speaking about the eternal peace as well? Yes. You know the, uh, the beginning of Kant's um, this work, uh, Perpetual Peace, he says, uh, he, he says there is um, a sign outside an inn called uh, the Perpetual Peace. The, and uh, the picture underneath is a graveyard. <laughs> uh, and, um, uh, but he also talks there <laughs> he, he says that um, uh, it's not sufficient uh, just to stop war. That just produces you a kind of ceasefire. Um, actually, peace is not natural. Uh, the natural condition of mankind is, is war. Uh, peace needs to be established. Uh, how? And the answer is through institutions. Just as peace at a national level has been established through institutions, peace at an international level can be with difficulty established through institutions. Uh, and I think the European Union is a contribution to that. It's not the whole story, because actually I think that NATO plays an important part in, in the European peace. The presence of the Americans and the background in Europe has always been vital. But speaking of peace and what negotiations can bring to peace, let's see uh, sort of one of the next clips here, which... Shall, um, shall I do the little introduction? Oh yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Sorry, that's right. Yeah. Uh, I just want to give a little um, setting of what we're going to see now. The, um, we're in the film at a point where uh, the parties have been negotiating for three days, and everybody thinks that there's now an agreement, and we're really getting also to the deadline for the Serbs uh, to have their um, uh, candidate status discussed at the European Council, or first at the Foreign Affairs Council. Um, but everybody thinks there's an agreement. The Serbs left the council building because they want to double check with the Belgrade and nobody heard a word for them for six hours and the, the European Union team is still waiting and the Kosovo team is still waiting and uh, this is where we jump in now. negotiation, you enter with an element of uncertainty, one part can leave, not show up again. 
What does uh, what does the tie matter to uh, to negotiations? Well, the tie doesn't actually matter at all. Actually, the, um, uh, if you if you see at the beginning of the film, I was quite struck when I saw the film because I hadn't noticed it. Uh, you see me making jokes. It's quite unusual. Um, I don't do this a lot of the time, but that matters because actually what you're trying to do is you're trying to get people to relax a little bit. Uh, and that's why I held these negotiations in my office. Uh, to avoid having it in a kind of big formal setting. Uh, if you do that, then people think they're going to make speeches. Uh, whereas, actually, what I wanted to do is to get them to talk to each other. So we did it around a small table. So I think those things, in those sort of background things, the setting, I think that's quite important. Uh, doing it informally. Maybe even Karen contributed. Um, <laughs> right. uh, and, um, uh, trying to get people to relax, to be informal, uh, not to read what's written in their, in their speaking notes. Mm. Um, that's really the objective. I don't think the Thai contributes a great deal to that, <laughs> but it's a good, actually, you can make jokes about them, that's all. <laughs> but it ended up being the right Thai to sort of to, uh, conclude on. Um, but, but more broadly, I mean, you being a very rational being, do you see any elements of like good luck, charms type of things that still matters in negotiations where you say, if, if if this is the way it's turning, I see that as a sign of, of good luck, or, or you don't read in the tea leaves like that. I, I, th that's not me, I'm afraid. Uh, I'm very rational. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, no, I, I, I have no good luck charts. <laughs> uh. And you, Kevin, on, on your side, both seen uh, Robert, of course, negotiating with the other parties. Did you see any sort of special? Small rituals. I mean, you meant, mentioned the teacher that needed a hair done every morning before the show, so that was part of the important being ready for negotiations. No, I think they were just being themselves in many ways. I think actually what what struck me was that it was so much everyday life the way it was done, and uh, and it, it was exactly not a big conference and people arriving as if they were going to. Um, the most important meeting in the life. It was. I think the atmosphere was quite uh, down to earth most of the time, yeah. and and everybody was just hanging around in these terrible um, buildings <laughs> and hallways for way too many hours. So it became quite um, familiar and, and, and low key. Actually, if you ask me, I was trying to think what did I do for myself. My answer is fresh air. Um, and my bicycle ride backwards and forwards to the council building was always very good. This cleans the brain out after you've been through these long, horrible sessions. Uh, <laughs> fresh air is there. Yes, well, it's, I agree it's better in Copenhagen, but um, <laughs> you, it's better than inside the building. Anyway. <laughs> And on negotiations tactic, is there anything that is your method that's the Cooper uh, method? I mean, you have people that tend to, when they make negotiation, let the partners stay in the room, they're not allowed to leave before this is the sort of Vatican methods. You need the, the white smoke in the end. There are others that say, well, you need to let people sort of dry out, go back and forth a lot. Do you have anything that's sort of the well, your method? For all of these things, none of this, none of this, what you see here is only a little bit, it's the surface of this, because uh, for every session we had, we had probably been to both Belgrade and Pristina, we told people what to expect, we'd explored their positions further, we'd put pressure on them in different ways behind the scenes, so you only have what you see is the end result of that. Um, uh, but in general, the, the, the whole method here is what you might call the European method. Try and escape from political declarations, try and concentrate on practical problems. Uh, don't ask, uh, do you recognize the existence of Kosovo? Ask, how can we enable people in Kosovo who want to sell vegetables in Serbia to do it? Try and focus on practical questions. Which is what the European Union is. I mean, that's, it's, European peace is reached not by talking about peace, but by talking about coal and steel. Right. We have one more um, little clip from the movie that we, that we were going to show, which is where we're much closer to um, uh, the agreement itself, and it, this shows also how much just one word can make a big difference, and uh, so um, this is what the, the last part we're going to see is about. Can I come in? I would like to agree with you about the first, 
because I think it was 1.30 and we were all taking cabs, except for Robert that took his bicycle back home. Robert, first I'll turn to you. I mean, as a very sort of generally poised Britishman, we can sense sort of the, the tension also in you when they're, you're waiting six hours and then they come back with an, another word. What sort of feeling did you sit with as a negotiator at this time? Oh, well, as I said, this is the end of, this is the end of three days and we're, <clears throat> and we're tired. So everybody's tired. Um, and uh, uh, that's why actually it was a good idea to break and go away and get a night's sleep. Um, and I would allow you to give us the happy ending, since we don't see the morning where they come back in. And so tell us a little about the word intergovernmental and how. Well, how, how yes, it ends. about the word intergovernmental. This is really, in a way, it's, there's, a, there's a lot of irony in this because um, uh, the, the agreement that they're discussing is an agreement about. Kosovo participating in meetings in the region. Um, and we had described the meetings concerned as intergovernmental meetings. These are meetings about cooperation in 
crime, in customs services, uh, which have been organized now in the Balkans for quite a long time. And it's a good way of getting the governments to talk to one another and get to know each other. It's a kind of sort of attempt to create a mini European Union there. Um, and uh, uh, how do you know, if from the Kosovo point of view, how do you know that Kosovo is a state uh, and that others accept it as a state? Answer, it appears at these meetings. Um, uh, so for the Kosovars, it's actually quite important to do this. Um, uh, and we had to define the meetings. What sort of meetings are we talking about? And so we put in the text, intergovernmental meetings. That's what the meetings are. Uh, the, Serbs, um, uh, the Serbs had an allergic reaction to the word intergovernmental because they thought that this word might somehow imply that they had formally recognized Kosovo as a state. Um, uh, actually, it doesn't imply that. You can, do, you can attend intergovernmental meetings and you can uh, put down a note with the chairman saying uh, Kosovo is participating in this meeting, we have no objection to that, but everyone should understand we don't recognize them as a state. There's no reason why you can't do that, but uh, maybe they were afraid of uh, what the press would say or something like this, and so this word intergovernmental caused a bad reaction in Belgrade and they wanted it taken out. Actually, if you, take the meeting, if you take the word out and you say Kosovo shall participate in all meetings in the region, it makes it much wider. It means that you can include all the meetings of sports associations, uh, much more important for Kosovo actually than customs. Uh, things. It means they can join the Eurovision Song Contest, all of these things. Um, and for the Kosovo point of view, looked at logically, it would have been much better to have not had the word um, and the Serbs should have been insisting on trying to limit this. Uh, and the two sides got the positions the wrong way around. <laughs> but both of them are obsessed with the question, is Kosovo being recognized as a state? And so they're both insisting on the word for exactly the wrong reason. So this uh, is, is not a, it's not a, it's not a very sensible argument that's going on. Um, but this is what kept us back six hours, and in the end, um, because uh, the Serbs had agreed to this word originally and the Kosovars had, were determined to keep this word in, in the end the Serbs give way. It doesn't really change a lot in, in life. Uh, I should say the other thing to understand is don't think that when there's an agreement that's the end of it. Not at all. You then spend the next year or two years uh, <laughs> trying to get people to implement the agreement. Uh, and that turns out to be another negotiation. There was actually some of the next I was going to ask you about was what have we succeeded in at one point in the movie you're saying if we succeed in pacifying the Balkans this would be a great step forward for the European project have we succeeded well as I said here this was a semicolon the paragraph isn't finished yet and the chapter isn't finished yet uh, and so there's a lot of work still going on you saw Catherine Ashton earlier uh, recording the uh, announcing the agreement that she had reached at the political level between the Prime Ministers of Serbia and the Prime Minister of Kosovo. Uh, that was an agreement about handling the north of Kosovo. And that was, uh, that was actually an extraordinary achievement. Um, uh, and that was a highly political agreement. What we were doing was political stuff disguised as technical stuff. Uh, but what she was doing was pure politics. It was actually about... Um, it was about the uh, inclusion of the Serb community in the functioning of the Kosovo state. Uh, again, this would take a long time for it before it's properly implemented. Audience, just um, uh, a warning, or if you're sitting waiting, then in, in not too long I'll bring you into, into the discussion as well. So if you have questions, be ready to signal them. We'll just take a couple of, of, of more points up here, but so uh, if you're already sitting on your chair waiting to be able to answer a question, there will soon be a, a yeah. opportunity. Karen. Yeah, I was just thinking if I can say something, another thing about this would be intergovernmental and the late night um, session. I think which was, uh, besides the word and which goes to the core issue of, of the Serbia Kosovo dialogue, um, what is politically at stake, I think what was also making it uh, such a terrible night was that this is also an engagement of trust building. So it's not only what comes at paper in the end, it's also the process. 
So it has to be a fair, a good negotiation where you come to terms with what is at the table. But the fact that you suddenly play unfair tricks, which I think everybody agreed the Serbs did by coming with the last minute um, uh, demands, which had came up from nowhere or came from their lawyers, but they had known this takes for months, seemed unfair. So it was kind of also ruining the, the whole uh, raison d'etre of this dialogue that you build trust between the parties. And how do you get the two parties back on track and, and let them go out without <laughs> um, one winning or one losing in this, but um, so. But people, I mean, it's always at the last minute uh, because people um, only do things they don't want to do when they have no alternative. Mm. So um, there's always watch the negotiations going on now on Iran. Deadline is the 24th. I bet they run the clock and it goes into the 25th or 26th or something like this. It always happens. Uh, so. You can't avoid it. Jean Claude Piris has seen more negotiations than uh, anybody else in this room. He can tell you that. And I wanted to bring in a partner that we don't see in the movie, but which is really important when we have the EU negotiating, is the fact that the EU, of course, is a conglomerate, a union of member states, and and how they play into, of course, coming back to them and and they being in, in agreement with the agreements that EU make externally. So first on on, on here in Serbia and Kosovo, how you see that. Uh, playing out, and then I think afterwards let's broaden out to talk about more EU, EU in general sort of negotiating. Well, uh, uh, we, we actually we kept the 28 regularly informed. Um, uh, the curious thing about this negotiation is that um, uh, 20, at the time it was 27, not 28, um, uh, 22 of the 27 recognized Kosovo as a state, five of them don't. Um, uh, I thought that was an advantage for us because uh, that meant that the Serbs could say uh, it's not as though the whole European Union is against us. Uh, they could say, look, there are people who are, take our point of view in the European Union uh, and therefore we're not being forced by a European Union which totally recognizes Kosovo. There are our friends there as well and they accept this. So, I thought actually it was, it was good that we had that. Um, uh, the, um, uh, but the member states certainly uh, play, played a big role in this, and I kept them regularly informed because they all have embassies on the ground in, in Serbia and in Pristina. Um, uh, 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 Chancellor Merkel paid a visit to Serbia in the course of this while this was going on, which was extremely important. Um, and, uh, um, uh, and I know the person who runs our office, uh, Christoph Poiskin, very well. So that's an example of how sort of national diplomacy reinforces. Yes, exactly. Do, do you see the other way around as well, that you felt that members, some member states that had a different point of view were sort of blocking, slacking on, on, on getting the EU to result? Uh, we had some difficult moments. I mean, the original, the negotiation began with a UN resolution um, jointly co-sponsored by about Serbia Kosovo, co-sponsored by 27 member states and Serbia, uh, getting 27 member states, five of whom don't recognize Kosovo, to agree on the text for the UN. Uh, this took us a total of about eight hours. Uh, but um, uh, but uh, when you've done it, it's finished and everybody's agreed and you've got a European position and this gives you a real strength. And everybody says, it's true, everybody says European Union always disagrees. Uh, that's true, they always disagree when they come into the room. The question is, five hours later, if when they go out of the room, they've agreed. And they do that more often than you'd believe. I wonder us now to, to sort of segue and fast forward to what's happening right now, where we have another difficult situation in Europe and Europe's border that we didn't expect in Ukraine with, uh, with Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea. Uh, and uh, continue sort of uh, support for separatists in the east of uh, east of Ukraine, and and maybe also there on negotiation because a lot of what we see here with the Serbia Kosovo negotiation is based on that compromise is possible because both see a sort of European aspiration. There's there's something in it. There's it's this possibility for creating a win-win. So I, I I wanted to have your take on on Ukraine and particularly dealing with Russia. Is there the same type of 
agreements possible if, if the other partner doesn't necessarily see compromise and, and, uh, and rather see it in sort of serious on games. Is this sort of beyond the European realms and possibilities for, for negotiation? Well, actually the European Union's been, uh, been so far, has actually been pretty tough on Russia. Um, uh, uh, interest rates, with the USA of course, but interest rates in Russia are now I think 9.5%. Uh, this is because a lot of the capital markets have been closed. Uh, the French, who were selling very fancy piece of uh, uh, naval equipment, have stopped doing that. Uh, there are uh, uh, the oil companies are no longer um, investing and particularly taking new technology to Russia. So it's not the end of the story, but actually these are quite serious. Uh, these are quite serious moves. Um, uh, but as I say, it's not the end of the story. Um, Russia's still there. It's got. It's still got Crimea. Uh, there are still Russian troops in the east of Ukraine. Uh, that's not acceptable. And is there here a difference between how Europe negotiates and, and here I've made like I've been doing commercial yeah. for for your movie. Also say that Robert Cooper back in two thousand and three wrote an excellent book, Breaking of uh, of Nation. When I was once in a long time ago as a young diplomat in. Uh, working for the French as part of my inner training, I was writing about this book for for the uh, when he was a uh, foreign minister. And in that, you do have some sort of distinctions between how it is when we're inside, where we all sort of know we have to get back at the council meeting next month, and a compromise is possible. And then when it's with outside partners, yeah. right? Well, what the book says it says when you're in the jungle, you have to behave like it's the jungle. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, I think that. Uh, you need some element of that uh, when you're dealing with Russia. Uh, but there, uh, it's a question of, uh, I'm not suggesting nuclear weapons, but uh, there, it's a question of, it's a question of power. Um, and um, uh, it's Lenin's question, who, who? Um, uh, European Union buys a lot of gas from Russia. Um, Russia is the largest gas producer in the world. But EU is the largest gas consumer in the world. And we could actually buy the gas somewhere else. They couldn't sell the gas anywhere else. So if you choose to take that point of view, there'd be a big cost for the European Union. But if you choose to take that point of view, actually Russia is more vulnerable than we are. Now, when it comes to the military point of view, um, uh, well, I hope it doesn't come to the military. <laughs> <laughs> Karen, here I want to bring in you, because I mean, when. Robert earlier spoke about Yugoslavia as a defining moment for his generation and the generation afterwards. I mean, for you then, as a sort of European citizen, how do you see the fact that we now have a completely different situation with Russia? Does this feel like a, a big change in, in, in your world? As a European citizen? Yeah. No, I don't know. I, um, when I studied, I studied a lot of, of uh, Russia-Western relationship. So I think there have been many backfalls in, in the relationship since uh, the 90s. I think this one is, of course, much more severe uh, than the one uh, before 2001 and after 2007. Uh, but I don't feel it changes my life personally. Um, no, I don't know. And then as a movie director, I mean, um, when you talked about characters, you have here, of course, Putin on one side, negotiating with Poroshenko, the Ukrainian president. You have uh, the role of, of Merkel, um, the German chancellor being extremely engaged in, in finding a solution here. Is there a set of characters where you would love to be a sort of a fly on the wall? Well, uh, interesting, of course. I once learned a lesson being that you have to like your main character. Yeah. And um, <laughs> so I think it would be a real, maybe a very interesting challenge to see how and what would I like about Putin. But I think that would be my starting point before I would enter in making that film. Um, maybe a challenge. Let's see. I know we've got, um, in my clock, eight minutes left. Uh, I'm getting five over there. But, um, and as I promised earlier, I was going to bring in um, the audience. So. I'm sure there's somebody who's been sitting, jumping up and down to, uh, to ask a question. So, uh, what over here? Afterwards, there. Yeah, I might go uh, a bit out of diplomacy, but um, 
When I saw the documentary, what really struck me um, was that it was quite refreshing that finally um, the processes and the people behind the machine, if you like, were betrayed. Um, and I, on that note, thought that now that you both participated, um, do you see this kind of documentary as maybe a means to help create a new narrative of the European Union where us mortals, um, to some extent, connect um, with the people and the processes within uh, the Union? Should we just take a couple, maybe, let's say, all over here as well? Uh, yeah, it's more or less actually the same, thought, probably cover the same question, because if you look at the the public attitude to the external action service since over the five, five years as Aston has been the boss for it. I mean, compared to the expectations in the beginning and what people, what the, the sounding is in Brussels right now, I mean, this is really one of the things where you, where you could actually show people different. Is this a, would this, would this be a way forward for you also in other areas, like for example, the Iran negotiations or in other areas? I mean, this kind of, as you were saying, the, giving another narrative to what the ex external action service actually does. Yeah. And for Karen, I'm, I'm just so curious about how, I mean, I've, I looked uh, some years ago, there was another Danish documentary on a European matter called President, which was so <coughs> extremely manipulative, and where you could see, if you knew the subject, subject, how many of the interviews, where you have interviews with Schroeder and others, to take it completely out of context, put it in another context, mm. uh, and miss you huge prizes and everything. But you, you you done a film where you actually managed to 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 yeah. to portray the real thing. How did you were you under any pressure or were you in control of yourself? I mean the whole way through to, to get the thing and how was the reception in in Kosovo and and Yugoslavia? Because I really think it's a made a huge difference between the two in quality. Can we start with you? I think that was a big compliment here from yeah. all to, to your movie making skills. Much. Thank you very much. Um, I think for the first thing that was mentioned, um, I, it, was, it is my aim to make films about these international relation topics uh, from, from character perspective. Because I think what you often see is in newspapers or media in general, it's, it's deep personalized. And even though these persons that do play the game, of course, have big institutions and structures uh, behind them, it's still real people playing the game. And I think it's both very uh, important, but also very much more interesting to see it if you get to be there and get to understand the human beings. That's also why I chose to put in very personal elements in this film of the hairdresser and the bicycling and the the band because it's real human beings and you can actually identify with these peoples taking these decisions on behalf of nations, on behalf of the world we live in. So that's really my ambition to, to get into that. Um, the question about how I how it was for me to be in and, and the pressure on how we could stick to a line which actually it looks to me like everybody could agree that this was actually what happened. Uh, uh, stick to that it was being filmed or yeah I mean this was not manipulative this was a no, I think it, yeah. was, it, didn't take I think it was a reasonable presentation of, yeah. of what was going on you told the story yes. of what was going yeah. on and you, you hadn't made up your mind of what the story was to be before it happened no I think only I made up my mind on the fact that I only wanted to have characters which uh, I could understand and which I would want to represent uh, loyally so it was it was necessary for me that I would um, like and, and identify with both the Serb and the Kosovo, and luckily I uh, I did. So I felt it was true to the what I saw to represent them in in a positive way and to be on their side. And then we tried also dramatically, of course, to to play around with changing perspective so that you understand one and get really annoyed with the other, but then you go with the other one and understand, aha, maybe that's why you were so annoying. Um, so the objective was to, to try to get to understand the recital of it. And Robert, yeah. if I can turn to you now and question whether this is sort of the new phase of the external action service and what's <laughs> going to make you popular. <laughs> well, it's, I'm the old phase of the external action service. Mm. Uh, I, I think if I have one regret about the film, and of course the film <coughs> is quite short, so mm. Karen focused on, on, on three people, and uh, in a way my regret is that, is that it was just me, because 
Um, mm. There are a lot of other people there. And you see, you see Fernando Gentilini explaining that uh, no, Edith won't agree to change anything. Um, and actually, behind us, it's quite a small team, uh, but this is multinational. Uh, Fernando Gentilini is from Italy, Anna Maria Pura, uh, who you only saw a, a brief glimpse of, is a very talented Greek lady. Uh, and in the background, there are a couple of Germans and others as well. Um, uh, and, the, uh, and actually, the miracle of the European Union is how well all these different people work together. Um, and having worked in the British Foreign Office, I can tell you it's really boring. Um, <laughs> working in Brussels is much more fun because you get these displays of national character um, and completely different national reactions. And that also makes it much more interesting because when a problem is put on the table, uh, you go to a meeting, you get the widest variety of options you would ever get, much more than in the national foreign ministry. So I think, so I find European Union really uh, chaotic but creative. Um, but that's not, its, um, that's not its image in the press, I agree, and it's a pity that people don't understand that a bit more. I think it's been great, particularly also when we've had some of the sort of more gloomy picture in the, in the last session of the economy of talking about the European Union both as chaotic and creative. And I also personally think that when we've had many years of sort of European institution building, which has mostly been about not sort of uh, creating conditions for not making war among one another, that we are now also capable of uh, sort of bringing more, that peace sort of externally, and, and this is a sort of really great example of it. Of course, still based on very much on the enlargement method that there is the European Union at, at uh, the end of the at the end of the journey, and our big challenge, I think, will be how we are actually also negotiate with third parties that are much more recalcitrant and, and have a sort of different take on, on how the world works, and you, you don't necessarily come to an agreement um, at the end of it. And um, Hope to for you, Kevin, that you're going to make many more interesting documentaries in the same vein. I know you're working on something on 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 Burma, and so I just wanted us to thank the panel and. Um No, no break. No, okay. I'm being overruled, and that's probably...